We are live talking Denver Broncos football on the R-Lads Football Network here on the R-Lads Football YouTube channel. And talking Denver Broncos football means that we're going to talk with Chris Thomason of the Denver Gazette. Uh, who was with us to preview the offseason just a few months ago. The offseason is not over yet, Chris, but the draft is. A lot of free agency is. So how uh, so far, how are things going uh, as far as the fans are concerned with Denver this offseason? Well, I think, first of all, thanks for having me. I think most of all, the fans were pleased with the Broncos draft. The Broncos say they're pleased, but when have you ever heard a team say <laughs> after a draft, yeah. Didn't work out this year for us. Yeah. So, but uh, Bo Nix has uh, created some excitement. I mean, that's the main thing that's going on here in Denver is the battle at quarterback. And what's kind of unusual about it is that, that it's a three-way battle. You don't like to, you don't usually see three-way battles to be the starter. You have Bo Nix, who's a rookie. You have Jared Stidham, who is, uh, quote, the incumbent unquote if you can call him that he started the last two games last year when they benched and then eventually released russell wilson and then uh last month they acquired zach wilson from the new york jets the number two pick in the 2021 draft and sean payton is hopeful he can resurrect his career and uh, if he can then i guess you have a nice problem you got another uh, serious competitor to start this coming season yeah, I think it should be a lot of fun from my perspective, uh, being a Jet fan, uh, because I've I've often said that I think uh, part of uh, the problem with Zach was uh, they did not get him prepared properly coaching wise, and now there's not going to be that excuse. Plus, he's not a rookie anymore, so this is going to be his golden opportunity, and I believe that he should. In my opinion, I think he should be the favorite to win the job because if he doesn't start on opening day. That's a bad sign for Zach Wilson. Um, I'm sure the fans are rooting for Bo Nix, uh, but how have they taken to Zach? I know he's, uh, you know, he's from kind of the area. I know he's, uh, he grew up what about within 500 miles of, uh, of Denver. So does he get, a, is he getting support? Well, he said that the Broncos were the team that he followed when he grew up in Utah. And he said the only NFL game he's ever seen when he wasn't on an NFL roster was a preseason game once when he was growing up. Uh, you know, watching the Broncos in Denver. But, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any faction that's like openly rooting for him yet. I mean, he was so mediocre with the Jets. I think people are going to have to see him do something, you know, at least in a preseason game before sure. they believe that he potentially has come close to turning the corner. But, I mean, Bo Nix is their future. I mean, what happens if uh, – Zach Wilson, you know, emerges and it looks like he's the guy and he's an impending free agent next year. So all good problem sudden, to have. Yeah. Well, you know, it's not like they can hold on to him and then someone else can just swoop in and grab him. And then maybe you're left with Bo Nix. If in fact, Wilson wasn't the starter and Nix. So, I mean, Nix is there is their long-term future and Zach Wilson would have to totally outplay yep. Knicks to be the starter. If it's close, Knicks gets the nod. Yeah, well, I'll be rooting for him too. I just picked him up in my dynasty uh, uh, rookie draft. So he's my quarterback of the future as well. So uh, matter of fact, I have Zach uh, as one of my other five quarterbacks. So I'm in a good position. Whoever wins the job uh, might be uh, one of my starting quarterbacks this year. If not, uh, better off uh, sitting the bench on my team. All right. So uh, let's talk more about the Denver Broncos and the draft. Uh, but before we do that, I want to remind everybody that the R-Lads draft guide is still available. Here it is. And uh, thanks uh, to uh, my conversation with Chris uh, a few months back, I had the opportunity to preview the Denver draft. Uh, and uh, a lot of that was in here in this guide. So you can check it out. Of course, the main reason to look at it now more than anything for Denver fans um, with the draft picks that Denver um, accumulated here, they had a total of seven. Yes. Right. Seven draft picks. And uh, out of the seven draft picks, I believe all of them, the scouting reports are in this draft guide. So all seven 
Uh, so this is still, a, a, even though the draft is over, still a good opportunity for you to check out the scouting reports if you're a Denver fan or if you're just a football fan. It's not too late. And also, don't forget the draft review guide, which is the reason I'm having this conversation with Chris right now. So get pump him with information for my articles, for actually for my story on the Denver Broncos and the draft review process. Uh, this is last year's draft, but a uh, uh, cover. Uh, but that's coming out in about a month at rlads.com. And here on the channel, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. Let's get right to it, starting with Bo Nix. And um, what have you noticed, or just talking even to the coaching staff, uh, GM, and so forth, what is it that you think that they like about him the most? Well, they like his accuracy, obviously, and it's kind of interesting. I mean, he's drawn comparisons to Drew Brees. Brees holds the NFL record for completion percentage in a season, and Bo Nix holds the NCAA record last season, 77.4% of his passes completed. They like his um, accuracy. They like his ability to get the ball out quickly. I mean, he didn't take many sacks in uh, college, and uh, they like his maturity. I mean, sometimes these quarterbacks and draftees coming out of – you know, only played a couple of years and, you know, they're in college three years and they bolt. He was in college five years uh, with both um, Auburn and uh, Oregon and was a regular starter for five seasons. I believe he holds the all time college record, like um, 61 games played, I believe. Yes. So they like his maturity from uh, that aspect. And, uh, you know, they, the one thing you maybe heard from scouts was about throwing the deep ball. Some people questioned his arm, but the Broncos don't seem to have uh, any problem with that. And yeah. uh, he got, you know, he has I, a, I mean, the, the scouting report on his deep pass, uh, it, he, has, he has an East, uh, he has a nice deep ball. So yeah, I'm sure that's, everybody's got an opinion. Yeah. And I talked to Dan Lanning, his college coach a few weeks ago and, he, you know, shrugged that off and said, uh, you know, he, he was top notch throwing the deep ball at Oregon. And he even threw out the name of uh, Tom Brady saying, well, he didn't, really th <laughs> he didn't really throw deep and he turned out OK. And then right. I looked up Brady and I think in NFL history, in terms of average yards per completion, Brady ranks like 170th or something crazy <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. When, I mean, obviously, he he's much better in yards per attempt because he had a very high completion percentage. But he here's the all time NFL passing leader, and he's 170 in yards per completion with the length of his completion. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's going to be get the ball out quick and a, and a short passing game. And that's exactly what he did with Denver. I know one of the knocks was the fact that it was almost too quarterback friendly and. Uh, you know, there was a lot of quick, quick passes and you didn't really have to think too much or you didn't have to put it in a tight window too often, but still it doesn't mean he's not accurate because he is. And um, what is also, uh, and, and what also helps uh, you talk about um, uh, just his overall makeup, having uh, a, a dad as a high school, a very successful high school football coach, that's a big help. I mean, just imagine growing up, you're a young kid and your father who you look up to is this like genius uh, X's and O's coach for high school football. And that's what you learn as a young kid. It, it's got to be a major help for you. Yeah. His father, Patrick Nix, was a former quarterback at Auburn, you know, very solid quarterback, wasn't an NFL type prospect guy, but obviously played the position at a high level in college. And he was his coach, uh, growing up and then Bo Nix uh, started following in his footsteps at Auburn. He got off to glorious start. If you recall, Oh yeah, actually, actually beat Oregon of all teams on the uh, last second pass when he was a true freshman in his first game, but eventually it didn't work out in Auburn and he made the controversial decision to transfer to Oregon and that uh, elevated him even more. Absolutely. Best thing he ever did. That's why I, I all, there's a lot of reasons to dislike the transfer portal in college football, but uh, it's still 
more often than not is the best thing for these kids because it gives players like uh, Bo Nix an opportunity to go somewhere else, different coaching staff, and because nobody would have imagined Bo Nix would have been a first-round draft pick when he was with Auburn, uh, and look at him now. Okay, um, let's stick with the offense and got to talk about the second offensive player that the Broncos uh, chose, which happened to be his uh, big, big teammate there uh, at Oregon, wide receiver Troy Franklin, and they traded up to get him. So I, I wonder how much of the the fact that, hey, here's a kid that we like. We, we need to receive another receiver. Um, he's, he's, he's just as talented or maybe, you know, give or take, maybe a few metric points as some of these other kids that are in that zone that we're looking to draft. But he, he played with Bo Nix. I mean, this has got to mean something. I, I'm sure that had something to do with it. Yeah, it definitely did. I mean, after the second day of the draft and heading into the fourth round, the Broncos, like all teams, regrouped and they kind of looked at their board and it's like, hey, Troy Franklin, he's still out there. Some people thought he might go as high as the second round. And they had gotten a good look at him in March when they went and had a private workout with Bo Nix and he caught passes from Nix and they had talked to him then. So they got a good look at him then. And also that Friday, day two of the draft, which was uh, before even the second and third rounds, they had lunch with, with Bo Nix and uh, they discussed Troy Franklin. So at that point, I don't know if they were thinking about taking him in the, in the, you know, third round, they didn't have a second round pick, but they went with Jonah Ellis as their third round guy. And then lo and behold, he was still available and they quickly uh, reached a deal in which they traded up to the number two pick in the fourth round on that Saturday, April 27th and took Troy Franklin. Yeah. So that's going to be uh, interesting to see how that works out. Just taking a look at the rlads.com depth chart for the Denver Broncos here on the screen. So uh, we did talk about uh, Denver needing to uh, replenish the receivers, of course, the Judy trade and so forth. Uh, they've had injuries there as well. Mims, they drafted in the second round last year. So he's still somebody I'm sure they're high on, but besides that, I mean, we talked off the air uh, about Sutton as like a holdout at this point. We'll see when he comes back. His contract's up next year. Uh, this was definitely an important add-on and throw in the fact that they used a seventh-round draft pick on Devon uh, Ville. Um, maybe more of a possession type, at the very least, should be able to help in the return game. Um, this is uh, going to be a good opportunity for Troy Franklin, isn't it? Because that, that depth chart looks like it's wide open for him. Yeah, you touched upon Cortland Sutton. He hasn't shown up for Broncos spring drills yet, voluntary, of course, but he reportedly is seeking a new contract. He's got one year left due to make $13 million, but only $2 million of it are guaranteed. So we'll find out how serious his staying away is come mandatory minicamp in two weeks because if he doesn't show up for that, he'll get fined. But uh, the bottom line is uh, – the Broncos have been beefing up their receiving core while Mr. Sutton has been staying away. They lost, of course, Jerry Judy, who they traded to Cleveland, but they replaced him with uh, Josh Reynolds, who was a decent free agent signing late of Detroit. And then you touched upon the two guys they drafted, obviously, Troy Vaughn and uh, – uh, excuse me, uh, Troy Franklin and Devon taking him in the seventh round. He was a pleasant surprise at the rookie mini camp a couple weeks ago. And don't forget also that they get Tim Patrick back after he missed the past two seasons due to injury. So there's going to be a lot of competition in that uh, wide receiver room. And it would seem to me to think that it would be in Cortland Sutton's best interest to uh, show up and prove that, you know, he's the best of the lot because if he isn't, why, why are they going to pay him $13 million? And Bo Nix or whoever that quarterback is is going to need uh, someone like Horton Sutton, no question about it, uh, in that offense. So we'll see how that all works out. Uh, all right. And, and and so, yeah, so we mentioned Vile. Um, and just quickly, I know he's going to be 26 this season. That's why another reason he's drafted in the seventh round. Um but his numbers the last couple of years were okay. I mean, solid numbers. Again, he's got punt return experience. So, uh, and you said he looked pretty good in camp. 
I know it's uh, no jersey. I know it's all jerseys, but that's okay. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, they'll, they'll put the big stuff on uh, short uh, soon enough. Um, but uh, you think he has a chance to make this team, especially since uh, he, he's uh, somebody that could help in the return game. Yeah, I think he does. They like his ability to. He's got a big body, you know, six four type frame. They like his a big his ability to go up and, and get balls and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, you know, the competition's going to be tremendous. They also have Jalen Virgil, who returns after missing last season due to injury, and he showed some flashes as a rookie two years ago. He's you know might be a long shot to make the team due to their depth. And little Jordan Humphrey made the team last year, but, you know, he might be hard-pressed to make it again this year. And don't forget Brandon Johnson, who had some moments uh, last year, including catching that alley-oop ball uh, in week two in the final play against Washington. So, yeah, the competition for receiver is going to be uh, quite stiff. Uh, By the way, Mims being such a – I mean, he is he's a plus – plus uh, as a return guy and with the new rules uh, do you think the strategy is going to be well again if, if Vile does a good enough job and makes the team we'll put Mims and Vile out there and hey go at it is that probably is that like the best case scenario is that they're both back there well uh, they also have Traymond Smith who's a cornerback and he was a pretty good kickoff returner a couple of years ago had a touchdown return for Houston, they signed him as a free agent last March, and there was a lot of speculation he might end up being their primary kickoff returner. Then they ended up drafting Marvin Mims. But, uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of competition. And uh, obviously Mims is going to be one of the guys, but the other spot is pretty much open, and teams are going to kind of also try to figure out who you, what kind of guys you want back there you know, as a second type guy with the new rules, because nobody knows what to expect. But it's good you brought up Mims because uh, I didn't expand upon him as a receiver. I mean, he certainly had his moments as a receiver last year and uh, they're expecting him and they're hoping that he takes a big leap this year. I mean, it was kind of strange how he started out so well last season and then never saw the ball for weeks on end. So, uh He's, a, you know, another guy that's going to certainly contend to be one of the top three receivers and, and probably is expected to be one of the top three receivers this year. All right. Uh, again, uh, on offense, a couple more uh, because the team added, uh, as far as the uh, total number of picks, uh, they added five on offense. And let's continue with running back uh, Audrick Estime. Because I, I, I like this kid. I, I, I'm, I'm like more of a traditional downhill, physical running game kind of guy. And that's exactly what Estime could bring to this team. Now, of course, you got Javante Williams. Everybody knows that. But uh, Estime looks like the perfect kind of running back to, to get drafted where he was. Uh, you know, later, in the, later in the draft, uh, really good players at the running back position are taken later in the draft all the time. Uh, you look at his production. Uh, you look at the fact that worst case scenario, he could be really good for you. Short yardage, goal line, that kind of stuff. Plus, he's a very capable receiver. Um, they must have been pretty happy to get him in round five. Oh, yeah, definitely. They thought that he was going to go earlier in the draft, much like they thought Franklin was. But after the quarterback battle, the battle at running back has the most eyes upon it because they have a couple of guys you touched upon, Javante Williams, who uh, had a serious uh, – knee injury October 2022 including an ACL and he came back last season played the full season you know had some moments especially early on but you know late in the season it was a struggle for him I mean he was having numerous games where he didn't even average three yards a carry so Sean Payton has said that you know guys are usually better two years after the ACL. We'll see if that's the case with him, but he doesn't have any guaranteed money left in his contract. And if he doesn't look any better than he did late last season, he could be gone. And then Samaji P. Ryan is another guy who could be expendable as well. He doesn't have any guaranteed money on his contract left. And uh, he's in the final year, especially since um, Estime is a kind of similar physical back to him yep. and don't forget also that uh they drafted blake watson or excuse me they signed blake watson as an undrafted free agent most people thought he would be a sixth or seventh round pick out of memphis and 
He's a guy who uh, was a thousand yard rusher, also can catch the ball. He'll be in the competition. And then you still have Jaleel McLaughlin, who had his moments after being an undrafted guy last year. So tremendous competition there will be in the running back room. Yeah, uh, overall, just uh, taking a look at those two skill positions, it looks like uh, it's a lot deeper now. That's what you're looking for as a coach. Uh, quarterback competition, wide receiver, running back. I know they didn't draft a tight end, but while we're on it, um, is, is this still the hope? I know Troutman and Peyton have this relationship, but it's still there's a lot of hope that Dulcich can stay healthy and and be the guy. Well, uh, Dolchix uh, did not participate last week in OTA's practice. And so, you know, the media last Thursday was the first practice they'd seen. So that was one of the big surprises that he wasn't out there. But um, Sean Payton said, you know, hey, you're going to see him sooner than later. It's not a case of where we're waiting until training camp. He's been continuously bogged down by hamstring injuries. He also had a foot injury late last season, but it seems kind of strange that he still hasn't recovered yet to the fact that he was out there in the practice field to start OTAs. And uh, you mentioned Troutman, but a guy that uh, Peyton was raving about last week was Lucas Kroll. He was a practice squad type guy, both in New Orleans in 2022 and most of last season. They signed him to the 53-man roster late in the season. He's a big, you know, rangy type guy, and uh, Peyton's been raving about him since late last season. I mean, he was raving about him when he had zero career catches. So uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see if he uh, can meet the Sean Payton hype. Uh, is that the kid from Pitt, Carl? Oh, uh, I'll grab my, geez, I should know where he went. I'll grab my roster while we're, while we're talking. Here. Okay. I, I, I just thought that that was when I, cause I remember scouting him last year. Cause, yeah. Um, yeah. Right. He's the, yeah. Out of Pittsburgh. Yep. Uh, yeah. you are hundred percent correct. Okay. So, yeah. He was well, kind of a guy who was an afterthought on the yeah. practice squad last year. And then all of a sudden he got some elevations and then they threw the ball to him in the waning seconds of the Houston game when they had a chance to extend their five game winning streak. And uh, it was intercepted, but it was a bad pass from Russell Wilson, but still everybody was wondering why in the world they're throwing the ball to Lucas <laughs> crawl in such a key moment. But that's because Sean Payton loves the guy. Interesting. Okay. And again, we're going to talk more about how the, the rest of the summer goes and into training camp when Chris and I talk again, uh, before the season begins to preview the season for Denver. So don't forget to subscribe here on our lads, especially if you're a Broncos fan, making sure that we're going to cover every team, including Denver and preview their season. And we'll have a lot more time to uh, get uh, feedback from Chris um, once these next couple of months are through. Okay. Uh, one more on offense. And that was the, uh, uh, the, the interior lineman uh, from South Carolina. This kid uh, played at uh, Yale for about five years. Uh, moved up, graduated, you can say, to the SEC last year. Apparently uh, did a pretty good job. And uh, he was the first team all Ivy uh, when he left Yale. So that's what you want to see. Um, and he's got the ability to play multiple positions along the line. He played center in college, but he's a big guy. So I don't really, you don't see many 6'5", 318 dudes playing center. So I'm sure um, it's going to be interesting to see um, where he fits. And at the very least, he's got center experience. I know he's only a seventh round draft pick, but is this the kind of kid that can make the team? You're talking about Nick? Yes. Take a stab at pronouncing his last name, please. Okay, let's see. Um, Gargulo? Eh, close enough. We asked him on the conference call how to uh, pronounce it, but uh, I'll have to uh, review the review that <laughs> tape for, uh, one more time. I don't want to botch it too much, but he, he's a project. I mean uh, – he, they called after he was drafted, they called him a guard. That's what they're calling him a, on the roster. And uh, he was a guy next to last pick in the draft. Uh, the runner up uh, for Mr. Irrelevant. I suppose if Mr. Irrelevant can't fulfill his duties, he will, he will step in. Uh, yeah. yeah they, he was a guy that uh, they, they, you know, selected, but, you know, interestingly, they signed an, an undrafted guy, a tackle, Frank Crum, 
who was probably a higher out of Wyoming. He was probably a higher rated offensive lineman. So they got him as an undrafted free agent. So he's a guy that they'll take, take a look at. And uh, yeah, it'll be a battle for him to make the team. And if not, uh, he might be a practice squad guy, but I don't see that he's contributing in 2024. You told me about the fact that they do like, speaking of seventh round uh, center prospects, they like the kid that they drafted last year in the seventh round for sites. So um, interesting. Uh, hopefully they'll get lucky again, but for sites is someone to keep an eye on too. And can't. Yeah. There's three competitors for the starting center job vacated by Lloyd Cushenberry signing with Tennessee, Alex Forsythe, who interestingly, in 2022 was Bo Nix's center at Oregon. Oh. So there's another tie in there. He's obviously got a rapport with Nix from that season. And then you got Luke Wattenberg, to, um, who was a um, later round draft pick in uh, 2022. But uh, on paper, you would have to think Sam Mustafer would be the leading candidate. I mean, he was Chicago's regular starting center for a couple of years before he went to Baltimore last year and only started two games. So uh, you'd think on paper uh, he's the um, leading candidate. But then again, I mean, they've seen foresight in practice, so they like him. So we'll see how it shakes out. Yeah, I'm sure they prefer, hey, it's, it's their kids, Forsyth, Wattenberg. So, you know, they want to give those kids the benefit of the doubt. Okay. Uh, again, another reason why you want to tune in when we talk to uh, Chris uh, right around training camp. We'll have a lot more of an idea of what the deal is there with these competitions. Let's now switch over to defense. And on the defensive side, uh, with their first pick on defense in round three, they went with Jonah Ellis. And Jonah Ellis, uh, if you're familiar with the name, you should be because uh, there are now four. Uh, Ellis's in the NFL, all brothers. So Ellis uh, really broke out last year in his first full season as a starter, uh, had 12 sacks, uh, but it looks like his football, his best football is ahead of him. Uh, and uh, this is a team that definitely can use a little bit of uh, depth as far as edge rush help. Uh, I remember talking to you about it and uh, you told me that uh, maybe on paper, it appears that the, the, these are not household names, uh, that maybe they have an issue, but there's a, a lot of good young edge rushing talent on this team. And now they add Ellis to that group. So they have to be pretty excited about the, the kids that they're going to be uh, working with and growing with. And uh, I don't know whether or not there's a star in this group, uh, but collectively it's a very intriguing young group. Yeah. Those young guys are uh, Jonathan Cooper, Baron Browning, Nick Benito, and they're all, uh, nice young pass rushing prospects at outside linebackers. So, but uh, Joan Ellis was another guy that was higher up on their board and they figured that he was too good to pass up in the third round and uh, probably slipped a little in the draft because he had shoulder surgery late last season, missed the final three games or so, but uh, they like his potential. I mean, it remains to be seen, you know, how, fast they might bring them around i mean if those three outside linebackers who i mentioned all stay healthy it might be tough for ellis to get on the field a lot but they certainly uh, like him as a future piece yeah and they're all young and cheap cheap especially for now so that's yeah a good thing. yeah and yeah pass rushers if they're pretty good they'll start asking for <laughs> a lot of money for contract extensions so uh if that's the case and they don't want to hang on to uh, some of those guys. Um, you know, I mean, I think Cooper's entering his fourth year, I guess. So they uh, got a possible replacement. Yeah. Browning and Cooper, uh, they're both uh, just big contract years for them. So we'll see how it all works out. By the way, Cooper, another seventh round draft pick. Very interesting. But that was back in 2021. Okay. And then wrap it up uh, with their uh, second of two defensive uh, draft picks, Chris Abrams drain from uh, Missouri and another kid, by the way, that has experience in returning. He's more of a kick returner, valet, more of a punt returner. That's the experience they had in college. Um, he's a little bit on the thin side, uh, but this is somebody that has the ability to play in the slot. Not sure that's where they want him to play. Cause he is again, a little thin, but very good athlete four, four speed. What do they like about him? 
Well, uh, he's another guy that, uh, you know, he probably the biggest news surrounding him is that he's got Justin Simmons as number 31. I mean, uh, Simmons gets released in a salary related <laughs> move after last season, a, a pro bowl player and boom, they didn't waste any time. And uh, I was talking to Chris and he said, yeah, it just seemed like a good DB number. I chose it. So he put some pressure on himself already by taking number 31. And, you know, he's a guy that could be in the mix for that other outside cornerback job. I mean, Levi Wallace is probably the leading candidate free agent that they signed, but uh, they're also, they haven't given up on Damari Mathis, who was the starter for the first uh, six games last year till Fabian Moreau, who remains unsigned, moved into the lineup. And then they had Riley Moss, one of their draft picks last year. So there's going to be a lot of competition, one might think, for that other cornerback spot, unless it's something that Levi Wallace just steps him up immediately and, and proves as a veteran he's the guy. So they definitely intend uh, to give him a shot to play on the outside and uh, go from there. That's that's why they drafted him, not not to play in a slot. Yeah, I haven't heard of anything of yet of him being a slot guy. I mean, they're set at the slot with Jaquan McMillan, but you know there are other guys that they're wanting to take a look at uh, who can play the, the slot as well. I mean, Reese Taylor, who was a practice squad player last year, is a potential guy there. And they, you know, keep talking about Riley Moss being an outside cornerback, but there's some people that think he might be a guy who does end up in the slot. So yeah, they'll, uh, they'll look at a lot of guys in the slot and who knows, maybe they'll look at Chris in the slot. Okay. Uh, a few things I want to uh, wrap up with you uh, about um, one, a couple still related to the draft. I don't know. Do you give grades? Are you asked to give grades on the draft from the Gazette? No, I didn't give a grade. I mean, if I did, you know, I, it was probably like a, a B plus type draft, I think. I mean, it was solid, but, uh, you know, some of their, you know, some people thought Nick's uh, should have been more of a late first round type guy. Some people think maybe they reached on Nick's. We'll find out. I mean, obviously, if he turns out to be their quarterback of the future, it was a brilliant pick, but if in three, four years, you know, he's okay, but nothing great. They might say sure. they reached on him and they might be looking at all the other players that uh, they passed over at number 12 to take him, including, you know, Blake Bowers, the tight end. So, uh, yeah, so we'll just have to see. Yeah, I thought they had a very good draft myself. Uh, matter of fact, I thought every team in the AFC West had a good draft. So uh, I know it's not Denver fans want to hear, but – I thought it was a really good draft all across the board uh, in the West. And I do think Denver um, did a really good job. Um, and, and especially look, when you, like you said, it, we don't know about Knicks. That's why trying to determine how, how a draft is graded or uh, how we perceive the draft. We know we're not going to be able to grade it properly for a few years, but when you go and you can draft a kid that's got all the talent like Knicks and you need a starting quarterback to, to uh, grow with uh, right there, that's a really good uh, starting point. Okay. Um, what positions do you think they were not able to uh, maybe uh, bulk up with? Uh, do you think there is still, cause you mentioned a lot of the positions we went over, you talk about competition. So that's good uh, across the board, but is there still a position or two that you think that they need to do a little bit more work on? Well, first of all, let me apologize for Mr. Bowers. We call him Blake Bowers, Brock Bowers, of course. So uh, going back to offense there, but moving back to, defense uh george payton the general manager talked at the nfl owners meetings a month before the draft about uh they really needed to get more athletic at inside linebacker well they didn't draft anybody at that position they they signed as an undrafted free agent uh lavelle bailey and it was kind of interesting because i did a story on him and he told me that Sean Payton called him not once, but twice during the seventh round of the draft, you know, uh, begging him to sign with the Broncos. So if the head coach is calling you twice in the seventh <laughs> round, that seemed like that was kind of a priority. I don't know if he's the type of guy that might <laughs> emerge as a rookie, but he is an athletic inside linebacker. And 
entering the draft, they had known as well that Drew Sanders, uh, third round pick last year, had uh, suffered a torn Achilles injury. But they didn't draft an apparent replacement for him. I mean, there was plenty of talk that uh, Sanders might move to outside linebacker, which some people said that's why they drafted Jonah Ellis. But still, he was a candidate also at inside linebacker as well. So uh, they don't have him to potentially compete, at least not until midseason. They're hopeful he can be back around the middle of the year from his injury. So competition should be interesting at inside linebacker. I'm not so sure that Lavelle Bailey can compete to, to start unless they really like him. but they did sign Cody Barton as a free agent. They've got Jonas Griffith returning after missing all of last season due to a torn ACL. Yeah. Sanders is someone, uh, yeah, we talked about him, uh, uh, before and he is uh, he, he's one of those players that w- it was really going to depend on where he went what scheme did he go to what did the staff like about him because he could play multiple positions so it'll be interesting to see what happens to him when he gets back on the field um, okay so inside linebacker uh, that's what you want to zero in on and speaking of Bailey are there any other uh, free agents that they signed that we should keep an eye on you're talking about undrafted free agents? Correct. Well, I mentioned Frank Crum out yep. of uh, Wyoming. He was a, he was a nice uh, signing for them. One of the more intriguing signings was a guy by the name of Thomas Yasmin, who's their international uh, player. He doesn't count against the 90-man roster. He's a native of Australia who showed some interesting flashes during his career at Utah. So uh, he's a guy that could have – potential as a growth player down the road we touched upon Blake Watson that was a you know an interesting signee a guy that a lot of people thought would be drafted so those are some of the uh, more intriguing um, undrafted uh, free agent signings okay um, now what I want to do is uh, is go over because so we have a couple more minutes I want to and, and since, since the schedule is uh, has been out a couple of weeks talk to you a little bit about uh, the schedule um, what did you think what were the highs and lows uh, for Denver Bronco fans uh, when they looked at the schedule well they they're uh, playing three out of their first four games on the road which is the first time they've done that since 1962 oh of course last year they played their first two at home proceeded to lose both of them so <laughs> so much you know a lot of people thought oh they're gonna get off to a great two and oh start so you, you don't always know i mean obviously looking at last year they've got one thing that was kind of intriguing is they have four trips to the eastern time zone and sean payton said last year that they um requested to the NFL to make two of those back to back because they want to stay on the East coast and practice. But so the NFL listened to them, but only to an extent of those four games on the road in the Eastern time zone, the others being Cincinnati and Baltimore, they put them back to back in week three at Tampa and then at the New York jets. So those are the two farthest. They're still a thousand miles apart. So it's not like uh, they're playing in Baltimore one week and the Jets the next. So they'll practice somewhere or other. I mean, I probably wouldn't make sense to, to stay in Florida if uh, you're going up to New York the next week. And I guess, intriguingly, week three in Florida, you might recall they were in Florida for week three last year and proceeded to give up 70 oh, points yeah. in a 70 to 20 loss to the Dolphins. So, uh that might not be the best omen being back <laughs> in Florida in week three. And uh, they're playing. Uh, so the divisions, uh, they're playing the AFC North. And what other division are they playing? South? The Yeah, the NFC South. NFC and South. The okay. key game there is uh, Sean Payton. It'll be on a Thursday night in October, returning to New Orleans for the first time since he departed. There you go. Love it. There it is right there. Yeah, and then you got the Russell Wilson returning to Denver. That's in week two. That'll be 
the Broncos uh, home opener. You got uh, opening at Seattle, but of course, uh, it's a little different than two years ago when they opened at Seattle, but Russell Wilson was still around. And yeah. uh, only one Monday night game, December 2nd against Cleveland. So uh, that could be, if the Broncos aren't doing well, that could be flexed out. So we'll see. All right. So there you go. That's the schedule for the Denver Broncos. Let's look at the schedule here on our show. Uh, in closing, I uh, just want to, um, uh, once again, just let everybody know uh, I'm going to take as much of this info, digest it, and put it in my in writing, and it will be available in the 2024 our lads draft review guide. So again, this is last year's Richardson on the cover. Not sure who will be on the cover this year. So if you have any suggestions, uh, Bo Nix, uh, why not? Uh, we'll see who they put on there. I don't know if they'll go the, the easy route and put Caleb Williams on there, but I'd like to see them be a little bit creative like Richardson. I think that was creative last year. So uh, that's going to be, of course, at rlads.com. Check it out for the rlads draft review guide. Again, uh, Chris, uh, we're going to talk more about the Broncos uh, before the season does begin. So I thank you very much for doing this as usual. And uh, you are – uh, not only, of course, uh, doing your work for the Gazette as far as writing about the team, um, but uh, as far as uh, where, can, where can fans like catch? Basically, you're just doing interview podcasts, things, or do you have your own show? Uh, no, I mean, uh, we do podcasts that are uh, on the Denver Gazette website, denvergazette.com, and then I can always be found at Chris Thomason on Twitter. You see the spelling of my name there. Just put it all together, C H R I S T O M A S S O N on Twitter. Awesome. Chris, appreciate it. I'll talk to you. I can't wait all to right. talk to you again. That means the season will be almost here. Sounds good. Thanks.